from the banks of Dewey Lake, it's the Dewey Pod Monster. What am I doing? Welcome back. This is the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. This is your weekly horror movie podcast about consumption or something along those lines. My name is John, and with me this week is the host of the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast, who is also the authority on Michigan craft beer and whatever else he wants to be. Sean, how are you doing today? Great. Good. Grand. Wonderful. No yelling on the bus. <laughs> what have you been up to this week? I have been watching Cobra Kai. Upon your recommendation, I marathoned it this past weekend. I'm, I'm pretty far. How far along are you? I just started season four. Wow, you are catching up quickly. That's good. I won't ruin it yet but i still have thoughts that i need to get to and you're probably getting to the point where i I could probably tell you most of these thoughts but i'll let you keep going so yeah i think we're we're probably getting close to well they they did season five right that's what they're up to yeah they finished season five yeah Yeah, and i finished that this week and like i said i have thoughts but i'd rather let you finish before i start going on a tangent about that that's probably a good idea we should probably do that yeah yeah other than that i haven't really been watching too much because that's been occupying a lot of my time, believe it or not. And that's fair. <laughs> I mean, that show's fun because it's 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 like just dumb enough and just quick enough that you can get through a whole bunch of it relatively easy and painlessly, which I kind of think is its greatest strength is that they try to keep it to about 30, 40 minute episodes as opposed to like hour long karate gang fights. Yeah, I, guess. I think you mentioned it, that it's. If it was longer, if they tried to draw each episode out to an hour, it wouldn't work. But because there's they're half an yeah. hour, like, you know, between 30 and 35 minutes, it seems a little bit more bite size. So it's a little bit easier to digest at a time. I have pretty much started to think of this show as being 90210 with karate, though. My original thought on it, like the whole synopsis of the show is in a line is any problem that can be caused by karate can be solved by karate. Yeah, I find myself really staring and not being able to concentrate on what's being said because I'm staring at Ralph Macchio's hair because it's so just awful. It's very used car salesman. Well, it's just really not real. It's like its own thing. It might as well have like top billing on the show. It seems like it's its own thing. And I can say this as a bald as a bald man. Uh, I mean, I can't grow hair, but I choose not to. So I don't know. It's just his hair. <laughs> his hair is nuts. and. You can really see these like I I like the fact and I kind of don't like it at the same time that you can tell these clear lines of when the seasons are, you know, like they they focus on a specific thing. I I really enjoy this, like, I don't know, Karate Kid extended universe that they're that they're working on. You know, there's they keep keep bringing back Mm -hmm. these people that you're like, I didn't think I'd see Elizabeth Shue and Elizabeth Shue shows up in an episode. I didn't think I'd see this person that was just some minor character in one of the old movies and here they are so it's it's fun in that respect but it it it's like corny but the good kind of corny and like i said 902 and i with karate and these kids don't have any parents people are getting beat up i like the last episode that i watched or the end of well there is a scene where a kid gets literally thrown through a window which happens a lot actually but in this specific finale episode a kid goes out to check and see what's going on outside, and he just re-enters through a side window, and I had to laugh. I had to watch that a couple times, because I was like, that's pretty good. There's a couple things that I can say that become more apparent as the show goes on, but keeping in context that I think this is supposed to take place like relatively close to whatever year this is now. I don't think they're trying to like move it back in time right. in any way. So you're talking about a essentially karate gang show that takes place in southern california in the 2020s and none of these kids have fucking guns yeah true i don't think a single gun has shown up yet even the criminals that are like that they're the criminals that they're seeing just in their random adventures to go look for johnny i'm not johnny literally but you know bobby sue or paul they come across whoever they're looking for that week yeah they come across these street toughs and nobody has a gun And equally as interesting is these giant karate gang wars break out all over the school district. No one calls the cops ever. It's just like, oh, well, there's there's karate happening again. So Ah, better close the windows. Let it pass. It'll roll itself out. 
Yeah, it's so. it's nuts. But I, I do enjoy it. And I'll, I'll probably roll through. And next time we talk, I might be up through episode five or season five. Who knows? Or maybe done with it. I mean, at the rate you're going, it wouldn't surprise me because it was only a week ago when you were just starring it. So, yeah, it won't be a week when this episode comes out in a week. I know. Tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, that's fine. But <laughs> yeah, we'll be. It'll seem like an eternity to the audience at home, but it, it was only a week and I've blown through at least at least three seasons of it. So it's uh, it's got its hooks in. Yeah, that's good. He said that was pretty much all you caught up on. Yeah, that's, the week. that's really all I had time to watch. OK, I kind of fell into like a makeshift rabbit hole of different documentaries over the like some short one kind of longer and one that I kind of feel like you need to watch. Because there's a, well, a second. I mean, I, I found some like kind of shitty, kind of interesting documentary on the dead Kennedys on YouTube. It's only like 45 minutes long, which is about as long as their career was. But it's kind of one of those where I watch him like, I like this band. I know most of these things that uh, this guy is rambling on about, but it still kept me entertained for 45 minutes. Then I got into that Tony Hawk documentary that was on HBO whatever that it was that was about two hours long and i was like god this guy gets injured a lot mm-hmm. so did you actually watch that or yeah we i talked about it a while ago i watched it did you? i want to say like okay. two months ago or so earlier in the summer mm-hmm. yeah it's it's entertaining if you have any interest in skateboarding or just the cultural phenomenon that is tony hawk it, it's probably worth watching i fell asleep watching some making of the texas chainsaw massacre documentary which i don't even know why i put this on because, again, it's a lot of stuff that you kind of already knew, but you do get to watch the props guy go on for about 20 minutes about how he just walked around Texas looking for dead animals to drag back to the house that they were using in that movie. And I can't say that I really envy the people that were in that movie. He's the prop guy. What else is he going to do? <laughs> he says a lot of stupid things through it. And it's one of those, for better or worse, it's definitely a movie that would not be made in this the same way today. Like, there's no way they would have gotten it okay to do 90 90- percent of the shit that they did in that movie but it is what it is i guess i hate that phrase but here we are but it is what it is i'm also not a big fan of that movie so maybe it's appropriate so that movie texas chainsaw massacre for me was i had seen a lot of horror and slashers and stuff and i hadn't i don't think i saw that one till i was in my late teens or early 20s and it was really kind of shocking the first time i saw it when leatherface come bust through the door and he just clubs that guy in the head it's just oh you know that was kind of like really off-putting but i don't know how many more times i could watch that now well we'll eventually i'm sure do a whole episode on that movie but like you i didn't get around to that till i was in my late teens and i don't know if i was just kind of desensitized to horror movies at that point or it just it never really hooked me the way that it it seems to so many other people and i'm not trying to, to knock it if that's your thing more power to you i think the to me the most shocking part about that movie was always how little on-screen gore is actually in that movie compared to what you would think for a movie with the title texas chainsaw massacre but this is not a texas chainsaw massacre episode so we won't spend too much time on that the documentary that if you haven't watched i would suggest that you do it's on tubi for free i think the main reason that i would recommend that you watch is because there's a lot of really really horrible looking movies that are talked about in it I'm not familiar with, and I think they could be great episode fodder for this show. Uh, it's called Direct to Video, and it is a documentary about just that direct to video from basically ranging from the 1980s through the 1990s. And the only titles in this movie that I really remember being made were trauma movies, the rest of them are all just utterly ridiculous. I think my favorite line in the whole documentary. And again, I have this guy was either a producer or director or whatever the hell he was of one of these terrible movies. But he goes, I don't know why everyone's complaining. We got pyrotechnics, we got machine guns, and we got tits. This is going to be a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like one of the titles that stuck out was Psycho Cop 2, just because they showed a lot of clips from it in the documentary and the dialogue was so bad. And, but it was bad in the sense like they're trying to make like, in this little probably maybe broken minute clip they're trying to convince you that this guy is like a horrible person but it just came off like his dialogue was written by a 13 year old and it was pretty 
And there was also a naked woman with him the entire time for some reason. <laughs> so it sounds right up my alley. It's um, like I said, it is. I need I might watch it again just to kind of go through and take notes on some of these titles. And the majority of them had a number at the end of the title. So we're talking about franchises, not just one off movies for the most part. So this could provide quality entertainment entertainment for this uh, listening audience for at least, you know, four days. You'll have to check that out because I'm always I'm, I'm curious to see how many of those movies that they mention I've actually seen or heard about. And yeah, I think I find a lot of great kind of hidden gems, you know, looking at stuff like that, where it's just movies you've never heard of that just sound so ridiculous that you feel like you have to watch them. I've based a lot of my life on that. Well, and I would like to go through and cross-reference that folder on your Plex server of all those like B movies to see how many are in because that folder is awesome. <laughs> but that is also a file that like, I'm like, this is gonna take forever for me to find fucking anything in here. Yeah, so. It's a little <laughs> impenetrable, even for me. But it's it's fantastic at the same time. But yeah, that was the big thing that I like. I actually still have about a half hour left to go on that documentary. I had to leave to go to a uh, family birthday party. But I was thoroughly like, man, I really should be taking notes. But I got to, you know, do stuff and get ready and all this and kind of had to play in the background. I kept hearing dialogue pop up. That I was like, what the hell did that guy just say? And I'd have to stop what I was doing, go look and see what was going on. And then it took me like probably 10 minutes longer than it should have just to get dressed because I kept walking out of the room and coming back like, wait, what? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what did that guy just say? <laughs> right. So definitely worth looking at. Like I said, that is on Tubi. And I, if I can send you a link to that, I will, because it's might be good research. Yeah, we can include it in the show notes, too. Yeah, absolutely. Other than that, the only other thing I really went and watched this week was this week's topic. So kind of taking a break from the, the horror movies for maybe an hour or two we we are talking about the movie raw deal which is a arnold schwarzenegger movie that took place in his chronological timeline between commando and predator and if you're wondering why you didn't hear about this movie between commando and predator or why you might not have heard about this movie between commando and predator we're going to tell you about it do you want to go ahead and do the rundown on the synopsis for this one? Yeah, we're we're uh, just wanted to mention, too, we're popping our Arnold cherry on this movie. This is the first that may be very vulgar and disgraceful and distasteful. I think it's appropriate. Yeah, that's true. I, I do, too. So did we, did we mention the, the name of this movie? <laughs> I did. I said it's Raw Deal. OK, so, so this is uh, the synopsis of this. The IMDb two line synopsis are actually one sentence synopsis is. A former FBI agent turned small town sheriff agrees to help the FBI chief infiltrate the Chicago mafia when the FBI chief's son is killed by them. A little bit of a run on sense, but it works. Yeah, a little so. bit. The storyline on IMDb is quite a bit longer, and I think it's it would you could pretty much just read this and, and know what the hell's going on in the movie. So we won't get into that. Before we go too far into this movie, I actually this is also arguably the first like kind of bad action movie or I guess, fodder action movie in the vein of what we try to do on this show that we've gone to. And I think it's a good place to start because I'm of the opinion of the 80s action stars. Arnold is kind of the biggest and the brightest out of them. And this movie is by no means one of his best, but you can still see that Arnold is kind of the reason why this movie works to an extent. Is that fair to say? I think that Arnold is the extreme reason why this movie works. I don't think there's any, if he wasn't in this role, I don't know. I don't think we could see, well, Stallone could probably. I could see Seagal this. making it. Yeah. Interesting. But I feel like. But it'd be a different kind. It'd be a whole different vibe if one of those guys was doing it. Yeah. And I don't think it's not like this movie couldn't be made without without Arnold, but he adds a specific, I don't know, je ne sais quoi to this kind of movie, to this movie that really makes it work. Like it would be, like you said, a different way different tone this is probably the first of the like the modern day action for for arnold then right i mean we had conan commando came oh, out ter- right yeah, before in terminator stuff like that but so this actually this movie was sandwiched between so if you look at his i actually was cross-referencing this before we start if you look at his actual like filmography he has you know Way before, well, not way, but a couple years before this, he's got Conan and the Terminator, both the Conan movies. 
and uh, Red Sonia, which is another kind of weird one for yeah. him. Sword and sandal kind of deal. Yeah. Then he does Commando, which, in my opinion, that's where Arnold really becomes Schwarzenegger at that point. Right. He's got a credit for some music video that I'm not familiar with, but I might look up after this because it. I just want to see an Arnold Schwarzenegger music video. It's called Stop the Madness, if anyone's looking. <laughs> then he does Raw Deal, and then after that, it's Predator, The Running Man, and then it you know kind of goes from there. This movie, from the little research that I did on it, was a kind of a means to an end for him. He did this movie to get out of, because he owed the studio a film. He was trying to get the role of Quaid for Total Recall. I guess somehow by him doing this, it worked him into the uh, cast of Total Recall. Not quite sure how that works, but that I guess it's somehow linked to that. So I noticed that John De Laurentiis' name is on this. This is a De Laurentiis picture. Is this Dino De Laurentiis is the guy that he's basically like the schlockmeister, all these really crap movies of the 80s. You know if they're like related in any way? I have no idea. Okay. I'm going to say yes, because why not? Well, De Laurentiis probably isn't that big of a common name in film, but you never know. The fun thing about this movie, and we'll get into the more specifics, is this movie, you know, it's weird because, like we said, it's kind of sandwiched right between two of Arnold's bigger movies being Commando and Predator, which both look, by mid-1980s standards, pretty modern at the time. This movie, to me, looks like a 1970s cop show like from start to finish, like the way it's shot, the way that the camera moves, the lackluster effects. It just plays like, obviously it's got more of an R rating, so it's more violent than a, a TV cop show. But just the way like they progress the story and Arnold runs around like chasing bad guys feels like a 70s like cop show to me. Or am I totally off on that? I don't know if I picked up on that vibe. And just by the way, I just looked it up. It, this is this is the De Laurentiis Entertainment Group, DEG. So they did like Transformers, the movie. They like distributed Evil Dead 2, you know, so oh, they have a oh, that's good. Yeah, they have a nice history of kind of schlocky stuff. I don't know if I picked up on like a on a 70s kind of cop vibe. It almost feels like it's one of those kind of Italian spaghetti Westerns, but set in Chicago. Yeah. It has that feel for sure. So maybe that's kind of like similar to the vibe that you're talking about. What did you like about this movie? I liked quite a bit about this movie. I was really surprised when I think of Arnold. I don't think of necessarily acting, but while he <laughs> always plays a character that's like, you know, it's like Jean-Claude Van Damme. If he was playing in a, a movie where he was a quote unquote American, he'd be from like New Orleans or he'd be a Creole or they'd have to say something to make him his accent work right it wasn't just like well his name kind is kind of like if he was playing an alien they'd have to recast him as a bigger dude who didn't act like john claude van damme yeah yeah exactly but so arnold's <laughs> acting in this is pretty solid like i mean it's his accent it's arnold you know he's not doesn't have he's not known for having this huge range right i don't think he's ever been in the running for an academy award but it's not that bad it's actually pretty good i thought he did a really good job at this the the, the other thing that i liked about this there are great, of course, one-liners. You know, there's great little actors that show up that you're like, oh, this guy's in this. And this has a really nice, it's an hour and 45 minutes, which is really long for an action film. But it's fairly straightforward. It's almost like simply straightforward. There's no big, there's like a little bit of a twist near the end that kind of, you can see it coming from a mile away. So it's not like it's some, some, it's going to blow your mind. It's not like, again, an M. Night Shyamalan twist or anything, but they there's this scene where it's like it, they he gets double crossed. But for the most, that's like the most complicated thing that happens. He gets a raw deal. That's right. Exactly. So I, I, I enjoyed the fact that he's, you know, I don't know. He's just this kind of family guy or whatever. You know, his wife is pissed off at him because he he got kicked out of the FBI or he had to resign and comes back and he's trying to earn his way back in thanks to Ralphie's dad from a Christmas story kind of giving him the chance to earn his job back on the sly so I just thought it was a good kind of premise overall and and Arnold's kind of impressive in you know, all things considered I actually think what's interesting about his acting in this movie considering that he wasn't really invested in this movie from like it wasn't like a movie that he was passionate about doing you could tell that he's really trying to put forth an effort in it 
I don't even know if I want to say the problem, but the the issue would be that he's still Arnold Schwarzenegger and he comes off as Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to act. But if he didn't, it almost kind of lends to the charm of this weird little goofy movie. It works. And what's funny about this movie is you're right. It does kind of run long. Like every time I've watched this movie and I've watched it, I don't know how many times, but a handful of times, I always hit a point where there's like my brain just stops kind of paying attention for like 15 minutes of the movie. And then all of a sudden we're kind of near the end. And it, I never feel like I'm really missing much of anything because there's so much like the glue of this movie is like Arnold shows up somewhere. They chase some people around and some gunshots get fired. And then occasionally I don't remember her name. It's probably Monique. Is that the, the female lead in the yeah. set after, after the wife throws cake at him? Yeah. She shows up and kind of goes crazy on him for like two minutes. And then it's back to running around, just camera following Arnold, beat someone up, shoot someone and moves on. It's a pretty simplistic movie, but it's also the kind of movie that's like, yeah, but if you overthought it, you'd almost be digging a hole like every time that you tried to push too hard with it. The one thing that I always think about with this movie and when we talked about watching this, I've seen this a lot, but I even though I've seen it, and I'm when I say a lot, I mean like probably ten times. I mean that it's not like I haven't seen That's it. That's probably about where I am. Yeah, I haven't seen over it over the course of, of a times. lifetime. Yeah, I haven't seen yeah. it hundreds of times. It's not Terminator Two or Predator or something like that. But I can remember those movies so much more. Like this movie is just so kind of forgettable. Like when we talked about watching it, I couldn't remember. Have I seen this? Is I'm thinking, is this like Red Heat? No, that's not Red Heat. You know, I was I kind of forgot that he was actually a former FBI guy and he's trying to get back in. I'm thinking he's oh, he's going to play a character that's from Russia or something. And they're going to he's somehow got to infiltrate the mob. And this is why. Well, yeah, I mean, some of that's right, but some of it, some of it's not. You know, you, you, you I conflate this movie with so many other Arnold movies that I don't really think of very highly, I guess. And this movie is I think Arnold is it came in action in an era in the 80s where everyone were shooting from the hip was like the most accurate shooting you could do. I don't think I, I see other than a pistol. I don't think I see a single person hold a gun and look down the sight to shoot at somebody. It's just like a shoot from the hip to just blasting people. You know, like, how do you hit anybody? Good thing they're automatic weapons, huh? Right. What's interesting about this movie to me when, it, when you think about Arnold and his career is I always think this is like one of his early, early movies. Yep. Like, I always think this came, I, I don't know, I'm not going to say his first movie, but like, I feel like this happens well before the movies that, like you said, there's so many movies when you think of Arnold, this is usually not the movie that you think of. But if you tell me, hey, let's put on Raw Deal. Yeah, it's a decent enough movie. It's going to have Arnold fucking shit up and it's going to be fun. But it always feels like it's so much farther back in his you know, filmography than where it does land. Because it kind of lands right in the middle of where his apex is. And I think that's why I think that his acting is so much better than I, I thought it would be. Because I, I always think of this movie, even I look at the year 86, seems like it's kind of late, you know, in his, yeah. in his ascent, I guess, to stardom. But like you said, he's had the Conans, he's had the Terminator, he's had you know, Commando is coming up soon. So it's not like this is his first rodeo. It's not like he just learned English and, you know, we're going right. to hear him blah, 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 the whole time. I mean, you know, he does that. There is that one really later. good, <laughs> r one really good blah, from him. But, you know, he's actually pretty good. But again, I always think of this as like a super early movie from him. So I'm always kind of surprised when it is as good as it is. I think it's interesting you said that he's got the one-liners in this because that's one of the things that makes me feel like this is an older movie for him is his one-liners aren't memorable like they are in a lot of his more, well, memorable movies. Like, he, they're in there, but they're not... It's not even that he doesn't deliver them. It's that they're just not as good. They don't... They're not as snappy. They're flat. They're not like... It's not like, remember, I told you I kill you last. You know, it's not like one of those. Yeah, or the stick around line or any of those. It's nothing that you, you know, any of his great movies, you can rattle off like two or three one liners, just like, you know, off the top of your head, no problem. And that's a big part of what makes them fun because they're cheesy and goofy and, you know, almost slapsticky in a way. His one liners here, it just feels like 
He's like, yeah, stick around, I guess. Uh, anyway. Or don't. Bang, bang. <laughs> right. <laughs> I do think it's funny that he's basically carrying a cigar through everywhere in this movie. If you like any time that you see him walking through a store, a restaurant, anything, he's got this like, it's never a fat cigar. It's always a long, I'm assuming it's supposed to be a Cubano or something, just lit, stinking up everywhere that he goes. Which is kind of entertaining. He is straight up making love to some of these cigars, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, and I know this is a different era where, like, you could, there's a lot of places where you could smoke inside in 1986 or 85 or whenever this was shot. It came out in 86, so probably shot in 85. But I got to think at some point, if you're just carrying the, a cigar around everywhere that you go, someone's going to be like, hey, fucking Giganto, put the stink box out. Right. Man. The thing fucking stinks. Put it out. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> I had a couple other things. Like the other things I really like in this is some of the like ways they kind of cheap out on effects. There's a chase scene somewhere around like the 45 minute to an hour point of the movie where they're I don't know where they're at in Chicago, but they're basically like driving up and down on the sidewalk. They're going around in circles and shit, and they're firing guns out a window at a car. And the best part about it is they shoot at this car. They show the bullets hit the window and it just kind of doesn't do anything. But then they show a close up on the window for like a solid three seconds where it says bullet resistant glass. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, is that a cheaper way to, to not break glass or is this just your way of trying to make this seem more dangerous? Like, it's the weirdest shot because you would think in most action movies, you want the glass breaking. It makes it seem more dangerous, blah, blah, blah. No, they just like they literally just stenciled on bolt resistant glass on the side of this like I don't know Buick or something like that. Then they don't have to pay to keep replacing the windows. The continuity, it's like nope, the window can't break. Sorry, your bullets are no good yeah. here. Take them home. <laughs> I don't know. I just that scene always makes me laugh. The other scene that always makes me laugh is kind of near the end of the movie. I mean, we're not really jumping around the plot too much on this. I don't feel like it's overly necessary for that, but. There's another scene, again, the best scenes in this movie kind of involve Arnold driving poorly, and he's in this, like, convertible, some kind of Chevy or something like that, but he's basically driving around this construction site, and he tools around the corner right around this giant dirt hill and just plows, like, just bumper first right into like the scoop the of a open, bulldozer like, or whatever. Scoop of a, yeah, and it lifts him up. It's just no big deal. It's It's a great scene because it's very, like, there's another movie it reminds actually it kind of reminds me of the scene in the stuff when they get to where the, all the army guys are but it's you know it's played up like this great action scene where Arnold's just driving around picking off guys left and right with this whole barrage of weapons and it just ends so unceremoniously by him just crashing into a damn bulldozer <laughs> and that's when he jumps out because there's a another like a dump truck coming up behind him and it smushes the car and he jumps out and he goes Aah! <laughs> I that scene that specific like construction scene where he's driving around and at the beginning of the scene he busts the windshield out and I was like what the fuck is he doing because again I've seen this movie countless times but I can't remember one minute to the next what's going to happen and then he starts like shooting from the hip but so the gun barrel can stick to where the windshield would be so he's picking dudes off from like you know they're like a thousand yards away and he's just pulling the trigger a couple times with a shotgun well that was one of them with but he shotgun. had a, he had an assault rifle of some sort like an M16 or something. I remember the shotgun. I was like, well, I guess if you're going to shoot a shotgun out your front window, you don't really want the window there blowing <laughs> glass at you. But I love the scene where he gets all geared up for battle and he's getting all his guns together and he's filling the case up and he's putting the gun, the bandolier, the belt, you know, he's doing all this stuff and he gets the gun, all the shit together. And he uses like one of the guns. Yeah. He uses like the AR and then he loses the rest in the car. And he's still wearing dress pants in that scene. He's wearing like a wife beater dress pants and a leather coat. That looks like, like it's too short. Clearly, yeah, clearly set for tactical combat. So, oh, yeah. With this fucking docker. Didn't you know bullets like they skip right off leather? I mean, they do when the weather is on top of Arnold, I guess. No, that skips off of his skin. Let's let's get this. Let's set something straight. You know, there's all these like Chuck Norris. Me I don't know if they're really memes, but how he's no Arnold Schwarzenegger is the bad most badass man on the planet in the 80s to the mid 90s till he becomes the governor basically i'd go past that he had a uh contest relatively recently within the past five years or so where he literally just put like you could enter a drawing 
to go drive around in a tank and smoke cigars with Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and blow stuff up. And I entered four times. I did not win. But you're telling me that there's a contest where I could get blown out to California and drive around with Arnold Schwarzenegger and blow things up in a tank. And his acting in the promo for the, I'll, I'll see if I can find the promo for it and put it in the show notes, too. But the acting when he's trying to tell you to come blow stuff up in a tank with him, I would have given him an Oscar for that. I'm not choking you up. I'm like, no, regurgitating. Oh, no, just burping. Well, that's good. Just burping. <laughs> and one of the other things I thought was funny, too, like every time I watch this there. So one of the characters in this movie is a guy named Harry, who is kind of like, I don't want to go as far as to call him his friend, but he's like the only guy that Arnold seems to really trust through this whole movie to the point where I doesn't he shoot him at the end or is he just around when he gets sh- anyway I was watching it and I keep looking I'm like why do I know this guy this guy looks so damn familiar and I, I end up finally taking the time to look it up and it's Billy Madison's dad well I'm a little disappointed that number one you don't know who Darren McGavin is and number two you don't know yeah. him as Ralphie's dad from a Christmas story no well that's fair too no I know him as Billy Madison's oh, dad oh jeez John we have a, a movie Christmas podcast story, man. you don't know Darren McGavin jeez well, I'm not a big Christmas story fan. It's an overrated movie. Well, I don't I don't disagree that it might be overrated, but how could you avoid it? I guess maybe I'm envious um, that you were able to avoid it. Well, I haven't completely avoided it, but I don't watch it very often. I don't watch it every year. I have a brother-in-law that watches it about 12 times a year, mostly on Christmas Day, and we just stop going to his house. I thought you were going to say, like, he watches it 12 times a year, once every month, to build up. He does watch it in summer. I will call him out on that. He watches Christmas movies on a somewhat regular basis throughout the year. Well, when you're sweating, I mean, what better way to cool off than to watch a Christmas movie? Turn on the damn air conditioner. Christmas in July. You ever heard of that? It's bullshit. And really, if you're going to watch a Christmas movie in July, watch Jingle All the Way. It has Arnold in it. That's true. Yeah. So Harry, Darren McGavin plays Harry Shannon, who is the guy who pulls Arnold, a.k.a. Mark, Mark Kaminsky, a.k.a. Samuel, what is it? Samuel P. What is his name in the movie? Knickerbocker. I don't know. Samuel P. Samuel P. Knickerbocker here for looking mm. by my jelly. No. Um. So Harry's trying to get him. He he needs somebody undercover because the son was killed trying to get information on this mob boss. So Harry's a real pivotal kind of character. He doesn't he's not in the movie a whole lot, but you alluded to it where near the end. Again, spoiler for a 40 year old movie. Harry gets set up. They set up Mark. Samuel P., whatever his name is, they set Arnold, they set Arnold up to go kill him. He doesn't know that's who it is, but that's who he's going to kill. And they shoot him. And at the end of the movie, there's a scene where they're doing the, he's paralyzed from getting shot and he's in a wheelchair and he's trying to walk. And Arnold does this whole thing. You know, he gives this whole speech about walk, damn it, my son, I don't know how to be a father and all this shit. And then he's wearing like the least comfortable and appropriate shoes for physical therapy he's wearing like dress shoes like loafers what the fuck wingtips what the fuck's going on with that yeah and then arnold basically like suplexes him into walk yeah <laughs> so, if you don't get up and walk right now i'm going to beat the shit out of you i mean if he said that that would be even better <laughs> but his the scene where he's going to to kill harry before he realizes it's, it's him when he tries to act surprised just by going harry He's the only it's one surprised. One one. <laughs> Everyone else, like, including the audience, can see it a mile away. That's the the Oscar moment for Arnold in this movie is when he realizes who he's shooting at, and it, it, there, there's like a full on like funeral with like a hundred people at it, like directly next to Harry as like these was it like six guys show up? It's with three assault rifles. Is it three? Yeah, I thought there was more than that. I don't know. The whole storytelling in this movie is it's almost straightforward to the point where it's questionable. Yeah, it is simple. One word. Simple. Right. And that kind of falls back on why, like I said, I have pockets of this movie where I just kind of tune out. Like every time I try to watch it, I will inevitably kind of start putzing around on my phone or, you know, something. And I never really feel like I missed all that much when I kind of leave the room or leave the I don't know, brain matter that is supposed to be watching the movie. I think that's almost a good thing, though. This is a movie where you can you're on full autopilot. You can be on autopilot. Oh, yeah. You can. I got to go to the bathroom. You don't have to pause it. I got to get another beer. 
got to get another drink, got to go get a snack. You don't have to pause it because when you come back, it's going to be your, oh, okay. I mean, maybe I missed a scene, like a shootout or a casino scene or, you know, whatever. There's no, there's no nudity in this movie. So you're not going to miss any of that good stuff. There was a scene. Well, you get, you get Arnold pretty much naked in this movie. When? They got the scene where he's drunk and passes out on the, well, I guess he's still got pants on. Oh yeah, he's not. He has his shirt off. There is a scene. There is a scene in the middle where Baker, who's played by Ed Lauder, who is in like a, hey, it's that guy. He's been in countless things. I can't think of a single thing that he's been in right now, except for Raw Deal. But they break into this house, right, where there's all these this drug money. It's in Cujo. He's in Cujo? King Kong. Yeah. He's Cujo and the 76 King Kong. Oh, okay. Well, they're breaking they're getting stuff. into this house and there's all this drug money laying around and there's these people like, I don't know, fucking getting down in the, in the bedrooms. And I paused, I slowed it down because I was like, something's going on here. There's a guy who gets up. There's a guy and a woman in the bed. The woman's covered with a sheet. The guy gets up and there's a frame or two where his dong is like hanging out. Like, why is this guy nude in a scene? That's not necessary. He's not. Like in his dongs hanging out under the sheet. What's up with that? It's the only level of realism in the whole movie. Possibly. Because that scene where they go kind of bust up that house, it's the most like unchaotic, chaotic drug house on the planet. It's like literally there's like, how many crimes can we stuff into this one house for this scene? But make it look like the people committing these crimes, they would probably never commit these crimes. Yeah. There there was one other person that I noticed, and I don't know if you if you noticed. There's the scene where the mob guys call in the bomb threat and they call the, the desk and the, I don't know, lieutenant or whatever answers the phone. He's like, oh, there's a bomb. OK. And then he hangs up and he's like, oh, I better go tell the captain. And he goes and waddles over to the to the captain's office and the captain's name's like Joey something. And the guy, the captain, Joey, whatever his name is, that guy is the keep the change, you filthy animal from. Home Alone. I was like, oh, no shit. That's got to be that guy. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I did not use that. I like your impersonation of him waddling, though. That was Oh, yeah. Good. He's had in that strut. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that this movie has Michael Myers from Halloween 4 in it for one scene. And the funny thing about it is he's credited in the movie. But because I only know the only other movie I know him from is Halloween 4, where he's Michael Myers. I have no idea who the hell he is. So, because I only seen him with, you know, the mask on. So, presumably he doesn't have it in here, but I, I couldn't pick him out of a lineup for you. Well, the great part is on IMDb, his portrait, his picture, his headshot is of it's him as Michael, Michael Myers. Myers. <laughs> right. <laughs> George P. Wilbur is killer number one. As George Wilbur. So, works out. He didn't have to learn a new name. There you go. I don't know. The only other, I mean, Again, these scenes all kind of blend together. Like you could tell me that, like, at some point, Arnold flew a helicopter into a police station and kidnapped a buxom redhead out and left on a boat. I'd be like, I don't remember that scene, but I believe you that it happened. That's kind of what kind of movie this is. Yeah, this is this is the type of movie I feel like if you are an Arnold fan, you need to just watch this. I mean, it's not it's not a masterpiece by any means, but it is so mindless and just turn your brain off autopilot this would be like you know on a i don't know i don't even know what i was going to say like a tv show or something where the character just needs to have something on the background and there's shit exploding and people getting shot and you know yes this is like a a favorite line where it's at the beginning of the movie where they break into the safe house where that guy the mob guy's hanging out and they say oh you're going to be a state witness you're going to turn state witness witness this and they have him set up. The two guys are holding him. And the, another third guy has a gu- like a gun to the back of his head. He's facing a mirror and they shoot through his head and like blow up the mirror. It's like, that's savage. <laughs> and the guy's like 104 years old. Like he barely walk. <laughs> yeah, he's like on the ground. He probably fell out of his wheelchair or something. I don't know. The only other scene that I really think needs to be brought up that I can remember and feel free to tell me if there's another one. I do think the cake scene at the beginning of the movie is pretty entertaining where his, I guess she's his actual wife in the movie Mm -hmm. is just shit hammered drunk and like power chugging whiskey out of a pint glass. 
while adding layer after layer of frosting on this cake to the point where she it it is I don't know how big the cake's supposed to be, but it looks like she has a solid like seven inches of frosting <laughs> on top of this cake. It's its own layer. And she's just oh, right. And didn't she like have the words like eat shit rain on the top of it, even though she's frosting over it? I think the it, whole thing. I think it just says shit on it. Does it? Yeah, because she yeah. says something like, This is what I think of this town. It's like shit. The other only other scene <laughs> I wanted to mention that I thought was great was he goes in he's trying to make a name for himself or he's trying to, for whatever his character's name is. It's so great that we don't even know what the hell the oh, guy's, his name yeah. is, but he goes in this like speakeasy. That speaks to the, this movie though. It does. It's, it's well, go, I, I think I know what scene you're talking about. Go well, ahead. He goes in this like underground casino speakeasy place. And I don't know, he bilks a bunch of people out of their money or whatever. And then, or he, he does something, gets in this fight and they kick him out and he goes across the street and he gets into a tow truck. And these people, these crowd of like in, I don't know, someplace in South side of Chicago, they're, they're shuffling and they walk right in front of the driveway and they stop and he's trying to drive and he comes up and he honks the horn. He's like, excuse me, do you mind moving? And then he drives the truck through the front, through the entire, not just through the front, through the entire length of mm -hmm. the building. It's, it's great. I feel like if we just kind of, we could probably just go through and like find cliff notes and break down every like goofy scene in this movie. Yeah, but at lot. the end of the day, this is just. That's what this movie is. It's a goofy mid eighties action movie that happens to have Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know if I have a whole lot more to add to it at this point. Do you want to do hot dogs? Yeah, let's go for hot dogs. All right. Do you want to kick us off on this uh, one? Sure. I think for this movie for raw deal, I would give this six and a half hot dogs out of eleven slick back Arnold's, which you don't see a lot of Arnold hair slick back. This is kind of like the anomaly. This is the one where he's slicked back almost the entire movie. I, it's just a fun movie. It's not It's not like the best movie you're ever going to watch. It's probably not like a go run out and try and find this on a streaming service to watch. But if you've kind of seen the whole Arnold catalog and you're kind of exhausted all your options for it, this is pretty good. Like you said, it's just goofy scene to goofy scene to goofy acting to goofy acting. And Arnold stays pretty much even keel throughout the entire thing. It's a very entertaining movie. It's a very good one of those movies, like we've said countless times now, to just shut off and watch. It's not, you don't have to think too hard. Again, you don't even have to like pause it when you go up and take a potty break. You can just kind of like let it play. You may have missed some little scene here or there, but it's not going to, you're not going to be confused as to what's going on next. I think that's a really good, a really good statement for a movie like this. It's a, it's a mindless 80s action film. They don't make them like this anymore and it, it's just a really you know it's just a really entertaining film so i'd probably put this at six hot dogs out of 10 over frosted bourbon cakes i agree i mean again this movie the downfall with this movie is that it just kind of blends into the ether of 1986 or the 1980s in general like there's the reason why this movie gets overshadowed by the rest of arnold's well, maybe not all his movies, but at least his movies in this era of his career is there's nothing that really sets it apart in a positive way. The, you know, the good part of that, though, is that there's nothing really bad about this movie either. Like, you're not going to get into this movie and be, you know, watching it like over questioning it or like worrying about like plot lines or any of that type of stuff. Like, it's I don't want to go as far as to say it's intentionally bad, but it's definitely not intentionally good i guess <laughs> it's just kind of it's an hour and 45 minute arnold schwarzenegger action film is what it is it's and you know like you said don't overthink it you just kind of can put it on and have it on and that's that it's a good beer and popcorn movie it's a good completionist movie if you just really like the schwarzenegger stuff and it's a good way to kind of break up the monotony if you just want something that has gunfire and stupid things happening on your TV. There's no reason to avoid it. But it's also not something I'd say if you somehow in 2022 came out of the blue and said, I've never seen an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. This is not where I'd be pulling you to start. So it is currently available on Tubi right now. We mentioned that streaming platform a lot, it seems like. So if you do want to watch this and revisit it, or if you are curious about it, it's available for free right now. I have no idea how long it's going to be on there, but I've seen this one pop up on a number of sites for free here and there. It's it's not like 
it's not like Terminator where people are arguing over the uh, streaming rights for this one. So <laughs> it's worth watching. And again, if you have seen this one and think we're wrong, we'd like to hear your feedback about it because this is one that probably deserves more dialogue even than what we're giving it at this point. Yay? Nay? Yeah. <laughs> That was creepy. <laughs> and if you want to leave us feedback, you can do so at crap.town. Yes, you can. That is our website, is crap.town. Uh, you can leave us feedback. You can go back and listen to all the old episodes, anything you might have missed or you know anything like that. All the typical stuff we do at the end of the show. You know, you can follow us on there. You can follow us on socials. You, you probably know. Sean, what, I, I'm all fucked up. What are you doing? Uh, you can find me if you want to hear more about my stupid face. You can go to youtube.drafttherapy.com. I'm doing uh, some news videos about Michigan news, beer news, news, news. If you don't want to watch the videos, you can find me on social media on all the platforms at Draft Therapy. Yeah. Social medias. Woo. Exactly. All right. Anyway, so I think that's pretty much all we got on this one. I somehow hit a brain fart along the way here. So we're going to go ahead and kind of wrap this now. Again, follow us, listen to us, give us feedback. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to you next week. Cheers. John, I'm going to ask you something. Okay. When's the last time you had a good piss? This afternoon? Fucking nihilist. <laughs>